Hi, hello. In this screencast, we are going to discuss partial molar properties. Okay, and so in our discussion of partial molar properties, we are going to let F be an arbitrary thermodynamic state function. And so what I mean by that is I'm going to let F be some thermodynamic property that's a function of temperature, pressure, uh, and composition. So for composition, I'll just say the mole fraction of component I. So F could be, say, my molar Gibbs free energy, molar Helmholtz free energy, molar enthalpy, molar entropy, molar internal energy. Okay, think of our uh, favorite functions from chapter five. Okay, so F will just be some arbitrary thermodynamic state function, uh, which is a function of temperature, pressure, and composition. Okay, and then remember that my extensive F, so F total, okay, where F total is a function of temperature, pressure, right, and the moles uh, of each species, okay, is equal to n, the total number of moles, times f, right, where by n, n is equal to sum over i, n i, right, the sum of the moles of all the species in my system, okay, cool. So our definition of a partial molar property would be, okay, my partial molar f of species i, so this is species dependent, okay, and f bar i, okay, is going to be a function of temperature, pressure, and composition of my system, okay. f bar i, my partial molar um, property of component i, is by definition equal to the differential of f total dni holding everything else constant. So constant Tp, and I'm going to write Nj, where Nj is meant to indicate the moles of all other species. So F bar i is equal to partial F total, partial Ni at Tp and Nj, or equivalently, partial Nf, right, because Nf is just equal to F total, and I should probably put that in parentheses, partial Ni at constant Tp, okay, and Nj. So the first picture we'll have of a partial molar property is essentially it's a response function, right? It tells us how much F total will change upon adding some differential number of moles of species I, holding everything else constant, okay? So if, um, say, F were the volume, okay, the partial molar volume of component I would be equal to, or would be equivalent to, you know, the change in my extensive volume upon adding some differential number of moles of species I, holding everything else constant, okay? So it's a response. It tells us what the change in our extensive equivalent would be, right? Our extensive analog would be upon adding some differential number of moles of um, species I uh, to solution, holding everything else constant. So it's a response function. Um, the other interpretation uh, that we'll often use or often say is you can think of it as being um, the effective value of uh, property F for component I in solution. And so what I mean by that is if I think about um, partial molar volume, okay, well, if I just think about molar volume, so if I think about the molar volume of, you know, my system, so if I have a system of um, pure component one, okay, so the, uh, what is the molar volume of pure component one? Well, I'm just taking the volume of my entire system, and that would include the volume, say, of my excluded molecules, Okay, so my molecules, uh, molecules of component one will take up some volume. Plus, if I think about you know, a bunch of uh, molecules of component one in my system, there's gonna be some uh, distance between those interacting molecules. There's gonna be some buffer, say, around a molecule of, of component one. So when I calculate the molar volume, okay, that total volume is inclusive of the volume, volume actually occupied by my molecules, plus you know, the, say, buffer um, around a molecule um, one, right, or the, you know, void space between my interacting molecules, okay? So it's that total volume divided by the number of moles in my system. So it's the average space, both occupied by a molecule and buffer, um, of a molecule of component one, okay? And hopefully that, that makes a picture, right? So try and think about molecules, right? So uh, I have a bunch of molecules in a box, right? The molecules take up space, but then there's also some distance between my molecules interacting in my system. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so um, 
Now, what, what is the partial molar property? You know, what is this? What is this madness? Well, now, if I think about um, what happens in, in a mixture, okay? So if I have a mixture now of uh, component one and two, okay? Um, I could calculate the molar volume of, of my system, right? The molar volume would still be the total volume of my system divided by the number of moles, um, number of moles uh, present in my system, okay? Now, molar volume of component one, right, is the average volume occupied by a mole of, of component one, both white space and that buffer region. In my mixture, you could think, you know, you have the void space, you know, the space actually occupied by a mole of component one would, would be the same, but that void region, that buffer region around it may be different, right, because molecule one is going to interact differently with molecule two than it would interact with the molecule of, of component one. Right? If they like each other, they're going to be closer to each other. Right? They're going to be drawn to each other. They're going to have a strong attraction to each other. Right? So if they really don't like each other, they're going to be further apart than you know, one molecule might be interacting with another one molecule. Okay? So another way I like to think about partial molar properties is it's essentially um, the effective you know, value, say, of property F for component I, or the effective molar value um, in solution um, at uh, those conditions, right? And so the partial molar, um, you know, volume of component one in that binary mixture would be the effective volume occupied, you know, on average uh, by a, a you know mole or molecule of, of component one in that system, right? So it's it's the effective value. Okay, and you know we'll kind of see where that pops out uh, a little later as well, right? But you know that would also be inherent, right, in this kind of definition of. Um, response function in that it's how that total property is changing upon adding say differential number of moles of species one everything else held constant um, so if I add a single molecule of component one uh, to my solution and I measure the change in my volume of that solution that's going to be representative of that space occupied by a molecule of component one um, in my mixture okay cool all right um, something else I'll also point out about partial molar properties before we, we go too far forward, right? And I'll probably, you know, pause this video so you can take it in bite-sized chunks and, and pick up later, is thinking now about, you know, partial molar properties being, you know, effective values. What is F bar I, the partial molar property of component I, in the limit that, you know, Xi goes to 1? Okay, so what is the limit of, as Xi goes to 1, oh, Xi goes to 1, of f bar i, okay? What is that equal to? Well, if it's my effective value, right, in the pure component limit, my effective, say, you know, molar volume would just be equal to my pure component molar volume, right? It would just be equal to, ah, not v, f, right? It would just be equal to f i, right, the molar value. So in the pure component limit, my partial molar property of component i is just equal to um, the molar value, okay? Cool. So I'm going to stop this video and then uh, pick up recording uh, as we work through some more cool relationships with partial molar properties.